So from Sindh in the 8th, between the 8th and the 13th century, numbers, algebra, trigonometry, astronomy went to Baghdad. From Baghdad, they went to Rome and from Baghdad, they went to Toledo and Cordoba. Because in Europe, Toledo and Cordoba had become very big centers of learning, gathering information from all across the world. Uh, you know, Pythagoras was that young shepherd's son who was looking down at the ground and making things with a stick on the ground and then he, uh, you know, came to certain realizations. So these were stories, but you know, you're laughing and I'm laughing today, Utkarsh. But these are the stories that catch you when you are in your formative years. Hmm. And these are the stories which take root. These stories have been built on nothing. It is just the credit and credibility of the white man that all of us accepted as colonized people that if they say it, it must be correct. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Vak Indian History Podcast. I'm Utkarsh. Namaskar, Sumedha Varma Oja here, ready with another piece of history which will astound and astonish you today. Yes, I am all set to be astounded and astonished and any other uh, <laughs> words that we can think of. Because this is one, I think, close to a lot of people's hearts. Um, you know, most Indian students are aware of India's obsession or the obsession of the Indian middle class or any class actually with science and math and getting good marks in it and doing science and math in, uh, you know, in high, in 11th and 12th A-level equivalent. Uh, and a lot of people even end up doing engineering as I did. Yes. But the thing is, when you study science and math, when you study both the concepts itself, when you study the history of it, um, it has a very, very strong Western flavor. Uh, you know, there's all, everything from discoveries, who discovered what, uh, what apple, you know, apple falling on Newton's head or whatever it might be. Uh, <laughs> yes. Or Newton is, and Leibniz uh, suddenly discovering calculus without any basis whatsoever. Time. Yeah. Absolutely. And even if you think about it, if you think about the way we view history, it was basically the Dark Ages, then the Enlightenment leading to then scientific progress, leading to industrial age, so on and so forth. So it has a very, very uh, Western tinge to it. So I've studied all of that, right, in a normal English medium, Western education. At the same time, I have also been aware of a few things, which, and again, I don't know where I'm aware of it. Maybe it's through conversations, maybe it's through books, maybe it's just part of being, uh, growing up in India, that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these concepts, a few things, for example, taking numbers, for example, right, the Arabic numerals. Uh, I know that those are, they are not from Arabia, right? There's, a, there's an Indian origin to them, which is part of what we'll discuss today. Uh, zero, of course, is well acknowledged as coming from India. But even calculus and concepts like that, right? A lot of this has a Indian link, which is what I want to know more about. I just know that it has. I don't know the details of it. I don't know what is facts, what is fact, what can be factually proved, what can't be. Um, so for me, it's very, very interesting I talked a few math concepts here, but not just for math, even for surgery, for example, right? It's supposed to have had an Indian origin. So I think we were and talking in fact, about this. Uh, Utkarsh, yeah. we have a viewer who has been asking us for a long time to do mm. a podcast on surgery, ancient surgery, Indian. So we yes. must remember that too. Absolutely. And so as we were talking offline, I think what we thought of doing was basically doing a series of STEM related podcasts, yes. right? Where we go through Absolutely. all these things that today, and it's not just about debunking what is known today. It's more about, okay, STEM is an integral part of our lives. It's certainly a big part of what defines the 20th, 19th, 20th and 21st centuries. Yes. Let's get the facts right. Are the facts unearthed or the facts devoid of any biases, such as a Western bias or a colonial bias? Let's get it out there. I think it's something And another important. thing, uh, Utkarsh, uh, it's okay to decolonize, but I would be 
uh, it would be a very mean kind of decolonization if it were only for the sake of it can decolonization mm-hmm. and bringing out these facts help us in the future yes. is there an approach to stem which will help us solve some of the problems of today yeah Absolutely. that's even more pressing one part yeah. is you know uh, regaining your roots and your self respect i am all for it the other part is also looking to the future and uh, mm-hmm. looking to why we want to decolonize not just for the sake of it otherwise it's yeah. okay you know if there's no issue which can be resolved by understanding these facts correctly then we may as well let sleeping dogs lie why bother correct but yeah, there fact, are many things yeah. No, I completely agree, and I think even for those of you who are familiar with the podcast, but you know, I will I will say it a little bit more explicitly. The intent here, as you said, is not to decolonize or to for the sake of it. It's like let's try to get to a more accurate picture of things. In that process, unfortunately, a lot of decolonization and yes. getting rid of uh, certain biases and certain distortions happens. It's not for the sake of I'm here to remove the bias. It's like I'm here yes. to. get to what's accurate but hey this is what has happened hence we need to understand mm. but good so there is so much to go i mean stem by itself is very broad so i think for today it's i broad. think it's very broad right so we'll start off with three things i think we just mentioned it in passing right now numbers numerals then the things we look at every day on the elevator on our iphones everywhere <laughs> where do they come yes. from and i am right. going to show you such an interesting illustration which will uh, yeah. take you back immediately you know 3000 years and then immediately into your elevator great uh, who <laughs> needs a time machine when you can do that <laughs> in this of this podcast so that's number yeah. one uh, no pun intended <laughs> the, the numerals uh, uh, number 2 again no pun int- intended is zero not number zero is z- zero <laughs> i want to know more about it And the it's concept. a very intriguing concept, right? Because if you think about it, we take it for granted. But imagine if you don't understand it, and suddenly, because you know, the you know, I understand that the ancient Romans had a genuine constraint because it was so cumbersome to represent larger and larger numbers. It became physically larger. So that itself, for me, zero itself is a very it's it's a mind. And uh, Uttar Shadno, uh, b- before we go on to these weightier things, something a little light. Uh, there is a mm. series called Young Sheldon, which is a spin-off of that very. Which I was just uh, watching. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> spin-off of the Big Bang. So there Big is Bang an theory. episode in uh, season six. I think I mentioned it to you yesterday, where uh, the young Sheldon, who is an aspiring scientist and prodigy and genius, goes in search of zero and its proof, and he can't find mm. it. And mm. at the end of that episode, he prays to zero like a god. now you know this is uh, so illustrative of the fact that zero is something outside the philosophical understanding of western mathematics it mm. they just don't understand it when we discuss it in greater detail uh, we'll see why it is so but it was very very fascinating for me because big bang theory and young sheldon both of them are in a sense you know propaganda vehicles for the universal western origin of science and math so mm-hmm. in many episodes you will find them just going back to an agora in greece and greek people looking up at the skies etc etc but here for zero you are unable to find anything i found that most interesting in the between the 10th and the 15th 16th centuries the europeans were grappling with numbers and with zero and could not understand them somebody rejected them somebody said something else about them so you know that uh, deep problem with zero culturally mm. philosophically remains somewhere perhaps but anyway yes. let's go on to what you were saying i found this uh, popular culture little uh, snippet most interesting and intriguing no i agree and i think there's a there's a bigger philosophical angle there right and which is why when western science was in the realm of very very hard reality molecules and pieces it was pretty ground it was okay then somewhere around the turn of the turn of the 20th century when it got a lot more esoteric right with all the work that's happened on uh, quantum mechanics and everything and just crazy ideas in terms of how waves behave and everything that's where it gets very very difficult but you know but the interesting thing is then it I, to my layman understanding even as an indian it it is not very difficult to understand if you look at it from the 
from the indian philosophical lens so that's another thing absolutely I'm and uh, you know utkarsh i uh, stopped studying science in school and uh, when i was in year 8 by the way i stopped studying science there was some very peculiar kind of option offered only for 2 years so i mm. have not studied science since year 8 but mm. well into my 40s i started reading the upanishads very seriously and from there there was a path which led back to physics so i have started studying physics on my own simply because mm. there is such a strong connection of upanishadic and vedantic philosophy with yeah. physics that it's just unmissable and i have come to it in a very very roundabout way and as a lay person so i am no physicist but i'm telling you the kind of strong uh, um, parallels which just mm. hit you in the face yes i'm sure of it and even i mean i'm also kind of i did study science in 11th and 12th and i i am an engineer though disclaimer the world's <laughs> worst engineer who has never done a day of an engineering job <laughs> uh, but yes i completely agree with you because somehow it's just leading back in that direction and something that mm. i i guess we will explore this in a later yes, uh, podcast yes. as well mm. and the last one for today and this is that officially the longest introduction to any work podcast episode ever <laughs> we've crossed 10 minutes i think okay getting close calculus again yes. the story that i hear is isaac newton locked himself in a room and then he came up with it maybe i'm misquoting but it's something on those lines <laughs> Yes, so again, yes. It was a bit. sudden, miraculous burst of genius, yeah, and uh, yeah. how miraculous it was, and what a coincidence it was. I really must tell this story. But uh, Utkarsh, I just have one caveat. You know, mm. this is a lot of material. This is a lot of stuff to unpack. So I am not sure whether we'll be able to do it in the one hour. plus that we mm. generally accord yeah. to our podcast episodes so let us see how far we get i'll try and rush yeah. along as fast as possible but there no, is really okay. a lot to unpack yeah. no that's okay i think we should absolutely uh, explore it correctly um you know we can always have more episodes if required i mean yes um, so maybe you not... know if your three questions are not answered in this episode we'll just move on a little bit let us see i'll try my yeah. best of course but uh, there is yeah. a lot of material to unpack and many many stories to tell and many many stories to untell although untell is not really a word but i wish it was because there are many mm. stories which we've learned which we'll have to forget if you mm. want to come down to the facts so should i start with thinking about india's contribution to mathematics to math Okay, let's go there. So you've mentioned numerals, which is correct. Hmm. You mentioned zero, again correct. You have also mentioned calculus, again correct. But these three are, you know, low-hanging fruit, or perhaps let's say crumbs thrown at us. That okay, yeah, you know, you also contributed some stuff, but uh, are, can I, these can two I just say something? Things. Since you just mentioned it, I just looked up the Wikipedia article for zero since you were doing hmm. it yesterday. Hmm. and i wanted to see history and then it had seven different uh, paragraphs on seven different locations so it was something to do with ancient egypt something to do with ancient china yeah then there's a paragraph yeah. on india and in the paragraph on india one line is mentioning grudgingly it, that was the first that the first mention of zero was in india as hmm. you know as kind of casually and as that yep. i found a little yes. bit yeah yes yes So uh, Utkarsh I you know we don't have the resources otherwise I would like to do many episodes on wikipedia busting it is the <laughs> most uh, you know terrible and uh, what can i say obfuscating source full of misinformation whatever suits a lot of the uh, well western interests of western uh, countries you know even mm-hmm. things like the definition of recession is suddenly changed if the us or the uk is going into recession the definition of recession is suddenly changed so the shenanigans of wikipedia are legion and i wish we could really do wikipedia busting we will i suppose automatically do some of it but i appeal to all our viewers please do not think of it as a satisfactory source it is full of mm-hmm. disinformation misinformation false stuff even outright lies so do not do not refer to wikipedia except you know the way utkarsh is doing it just to uh, kind of see what on earth are they making of Or some of the very important concepts or to figure out the birthday of your favorite celebrity 
<laughs> you could use it for that. <laughs> yeah, or the you know next season of Young Sheldon, you can use it for that. The airing too. date. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the airing date of Young Sheldon. Yes, you can do that. But please do not take it seriously. It is uh, one of the most compromised. sources of information and which is so widespread that it is actually scary so let's start with some wikipedia busting mm -hmm. now uh, what i want to i i was uh, saying that these two or three things are grudgingly identified with indian math or mathematics but this is not even a small part of the story because what has india actually given to the world in terms of mathematics and you know where the word math comes from it comes from the greek word mathesis and mathesis means hold your breath knowledge that you have gained through all your lives the soul has its own knowledge which it has gathered across all its lives and it is the remembering of that which is called mathesis and it is from there that math comes the word was popularized by plato appropriated mm -hmm. by christians although of course they don't believe in this cycle of birth and rebirth however mm -hmm. they've kept to the word math so this is knowledge that you have your soul already has you're just remembering it that is math but what is ganit ganit is what india has given to the world and that is calculation and computation so if i were pressed to give one word as to the contribution of india and this is not original it is from ck raju who is one of our foremost mathematicians and historians of maths living today ck raju don't forget the name he has a blog spot which i would invite everyone to read so he says it is efficiency it is efficiency of calculation and computation that is what india has given to the world not just zero or numbers so i will uh, also look at i'll show you one book mm -hmm. this book is called the crest of the peacock it is by george gevergis joseph now uh, c k raju says that george joseph has plagiarized a great part of this book from c k raju's work so that was also accepted and some small you know uh, apology or errata was issued at some point of time but this book remains in its form so ck raju says that the calculus part of it has all been plagiarized so i am going to refer to both of them today but more to ck raju although uh, george uh, vergis has done a good job in collecting many non western sources of math so i am going to look at his section on ancient indian math and then tell you of the you know long list of mathematical or ganit contributions made by indians so uh, if we go back to harappan civilization saraswati sindhu civilization weights designs brick technology which helped in construction of altars therefore geometry then you come to the vedic period so vedang sulbha sutra sulbha sutra is geometry much before euclid and we are going to talk a lot about euclid today arithmetical operations vedic geometry then you have uh, number theory this is 500 bce to 200 ad number theory permutations and combinations binomial theo uh, theorem astronomy then up till the common era of uh, 400 400 ce rules of mathematical operations decimal place notations first use of zero algebra simultaneous equations quadratic equations square roots how to represent unknown quantities have you had enough utkarsh or should i go on no i just got because the list is still to... long I got a flashback to when you said quadratic equations, square roots. I got a flashback to being in seventh or eighth standard. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, you know, math the, was the my favorite subject of, anyway. I, I loved it. It was so your, not a problem. I, oh, so that's good. Normally, you know, quadratic equations is the doom of the teenager. And I like math, math till, is the doom of the teenager. Till O levels, I would say O level or tenth standard. Uh, I really liked my favorite subject, eleventh and twelfth, and. Specifically, calculus is where I started losing a little bit of interest. Ironically enough, 
Utkarsh, then I must say something which I was planning to say later. So what again C.K. Raju says is that calculus was stolen via the Jesuits. It was stolen by the Europeans, but they did not understand it properly. Therefore, they have neither understood nor used nor explained it properly, which is why it is becoming more and more difficult for people to follow calculus. It's becoming tougher and tougher. And you know that many schools are cancelling calculus, don't don't you? For example, in I California, no calculus has been in California, calculus has been thrown out of school because it's too why? tough. Too tough. <laughs> okay. So it is C.K. Raju's contention that. The stealing was done without fully understanding and if you teach it the Indian way, then calculus is not difficult at all and he has suited the action to the word. He has done this in five countries and he has taught calculus in an easier way using the Indian, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, the original, the people who actually thought of sign and cos and the table so that was Brahma Gupta and I'll go into those details later but uh, Utkarsh you can blame European thievery that they mm -hmm. stole something and then they misconstrued it we have taken back what was originally ours in a distorted form and today our own children are also struggling to learn calculus so there you go but uh, what I wanted to say, see this very, very long list of the kind of concepts mm -hmm. which have come from India and I will not go to uh, more of those lists. All those uh, of you who want to can go to chapter 8 of this book by George Verghese, The Crest of the Peacock. I will mention that the Kerala School of Mathematics from the 14th to the 16th century is the uh, last or second last great flowering of Indian mathematics. Perhaps the last was uh, Srinivas Ramanujan. And uh, it is from the Kerala school that Newton and Leibniz and certain others whose names I will take stole calculus. So this is as far as you know the contributions of Indian math are concerned. Now Utkarsh, you have studied probably a lot of these things. So were you ever given in your study anything about the Indian origin or any Indian names about uh, people who were the formulators or important people in these mathematical areas. I think who were the know. Indians you heard of? No, Indian mathematicians and books. I'm trying to think who did I hear of in school? That's the question, not who have I heard of in general. Brahma Gupta was he mentioned in school? I'm yes, not sure. uh, maybe not. Maybe not, but maybe yeah. yes, because Brahma Gupta and his um, books are very, very important for mathematics. So you mm. see, there are dozens of uh, brilliant Indian mathematicians. We don't know any of them. We don't even know that they did anything. So that brings us to an important question. Why? Why don't we know? So we always end up you know, kind of uh, agitated about this issue that if these facts are out there, then why don't we know? And it's kind of crazy that uh, you and I have to do a podcast to get these things out there. But there it is. The good news is that the historians of mathematics today are waking up in India, not abroad, in India. And uh, mm. some of them are doing exemplary work. So I've mentioned uh, George Verghese, I've mentioned C.K. Raju. Everyone, please read his blog spot. He covers a gamut of topics. And mm. you'll find uh, those topics very, very interesting. Then you have uh, Bhaskar Kamble, who's written an amazing book called The Imperishable Seed. I will, uh, I will refer to him very frequently in this podcast. I will uh, also refer to, you know, Chandrahasa Lai. He's also doing a lot of good work in Vedic mathematics. And let me tell you just a little aside that in my book two of my Urnabi series, you know, it's about spies. So uh, those spies use a system of secret codes. It is based on the Kattapayadi system of uh, ancient Indian mathematics and uh, Chandrahas developed that code for me. 
so if any one of you is interested in how a secret spy code can be made in sanskrit using ancient indian maths please read chanakya's scribe wherein chandrahas helped me to make that code and uh, use the katta payadi system so you know it's actually perhaps from my writing on ancient india that my interest in all these things arose because i wanted to know and uh, if you want to know about uh, the pythagoras theorem of course pythagoras did not exist but that's the name by which we know it i have also used it pythagoras did not exist he did was he your friend was he your friend utkarsh feeling sad well i i remember him from my <laughs> from my books from my school books for sure he had a beard or something <laughs> <laughs> Utkash, if you were also, uh, if uh, Euclid was also your great friend, I am going to disappoint you very badly in about five ten minutes. And you may as well bid goodbye to Pythagoras because there is absolutely no proof that he existed. There was only a Pythagorean Pythagorean group of. It was a religious cult. That's it. No Pythagoras existed, but you know that brings me to the whole thing about the very, very cold, calculated, efficient, and successful falsification of history because of certain Christian chauvinistic needs. This was not done, you know, kind of by the way or just by mistake. No, it was a policy of the church, and it was a policy of the church to show the. superiority of christians and christianity so you know they began in the about around the 5th century after constantine turned the empire christian there was this gentleman called uh, orosius he wrote seven books of history against the pagans now this was the history of the world as the greeks understood it romans understood it from creation up till around the 5th century around 417 of the common era and this was only to show falsifying all facts that the world was the bestest place possible after christianity had come there and all pagans were backward aggressive fought with each other there was only violence no peace no prosperity this was the purpose of the orosian model of writing history up till the 5th century so you can imagine here by the 5th century there was brahmagupta there was aryabhat and uh, there was a lot of uh, math and science going on in the 5th century they were busy falsifying history so then what happened after that then you come to around the 8th century now remember utkarsh i don't know whether i talked about it in this podcast but uh, about the fall of constantinople the fall of constantinople yes yes you did and you know when the ottoman the empire so. yeah the yes. ottoman empire took over from the abbasid caliphate so the abbasid mm-hmm. caliphate had uh, won a war against one of their rivals and in the 8th century around baghdad they established their own caliphate so this was in baghdad there was a lot of in the 8th century math going on in india in sindh of course in all of india but sindh was a very special center where there were a lot of intellectuals engaged in this activity so what happened was that a lot of this information went from sindh to baghdad and in baghdad a lot of translations were made so this abbasid caliphate was a great one for gathering knowledge from everywhere so it translated chinese it translated uh, sanskrit mm. it uh, translated greek it translated a lot of books so this is how most of your questions today will be answered this was the way in which information was actually transmitted so uh, i'll just give you i don't know whether i can show you this map it's a uh, it's on my phone so probably not very very good but take a look at this map and uh, I, we'll put it on the screen so that people can actually see what i mean so between the 8th and the 13th centuries and this map by the way is from the book the imperishable seed and uh, one can refer to it from that book if you really want to look at it in detail so from sindh in the 8th between the 8th and the 13th century numbers algebra trigonometry astronomy went to baghdad from baghdad 
they went to Rome and from Baghdad they went to Toledo and Cordoba. Because in Europe, Toledo and Cordoba had become very big centers of learning, gathering information from all across the world. And once they reached Toledo and once they reached Cordoba, then they were in Europe. Remember at that time, the Crusades were going on. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge Muslim presence in Spain. That's why this close connection between Baghdad and Cordoba. So there was this, uh, you know, fight to the death going on between the Christians as well as the uh, Muslims. But at the same time, there was a lot of gathering and uh, there was a lot of transmission of information. So, you know, it was here that Brahma Gupt, his uh, Brahma Swut Siddhant, which is one of his most famous books and his uh, Khand Khadyak, two of his most famous books, they were translated. So there was this person called Al Khwarizmi. Now, Al Khwarizmi is very, 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 very significant, important, and central to the whole story. From his name comes the word algorithm. From his books come the names of certain sections of mathematical studies such as algebra. Because he was the one who translated all these books. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but let me go on with the story. So, this was happening between the 8th, 12th, 13th, 14th century. So, over there, what happened was that a lot of these texts were translated into Arabic. From Arabic, they were translated into Greek in Byzantine. And then, by a slate of hand, they were kind of allocated to the ancient Greeks. Remember, not the Greeks of the 4th and 5th century because they were in great... Uh, they were really uh, in conflict with the Christians and the Christians were lynching them left, right and centre. So, they could not be given to Greeks of that period. They were given to ancient Greeks with whom the Christians did not have any fight and they were safely dead anyway. So, it could easily be attributed to them. When I tell you the story of Euclid, then I, you will understand this very correctly about how Greek origins were falsely attributed to these mathematical concepts. I will repeat this. Greek origins were falsely attributed to so many of these mathematical concepts. Then we move on a bit in time and then we come to that wonderful period of inquisition, the inquisitional model. So, over here what happened was, that uh, the Byzantine Greek translations were further translated to Latin and they had definitely had to be appropriated to Christians because remember, if not, then you just, your head would be cut off. This was the Inquisition. You would be exquisitely tortured and killed. Non-Christian pagan stuff was absolutely not to be tolerated. Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther, sorry, had not already, Martin. you know, <laughs> yeah. not Martin Luther King, excuse the slip of the tongue. So, Martin Luther had already created, uh, you know, a schism in the church. He had protested and they were protestants. So, the Catholic church had become, you know, even more rabid if possible. And there was this period of extreme, extreme uh, fanaticism and uh, killing in the name of religion. You know, I think it, that's why uh, Christians have such a very peculiar idea of religion because this is all that has happened in their history. But anyway, so uh, these Byzantine Greek works were then translated into Latin and then appropriated by or attributed to people like Copernicus. There was something called the doctrine of Christian discovery, which meant that anything which had not been actually discovered by a Christian didn't count. The only thing that counted was when a Christian person discovered this thing. So, it would be said that this person was the originator of this concept. Whatever else these non-Christian useless pagans had done, doesn't matter. So, this doctrine of discovery has suited the Christian civilization and Western civilization really, really well. And it has been such a wonderful process, such a successful process of falsification that today across the world you will find those people defending this falsification against whom it was done. Indians for example. 
they will jump up and they will tell you that uh, what is it columbus discovered america vasco da gama discovered uh, the route to india through the cape of good hope i am sure you agree with all this utkarsh but if we ever have time i will go into the actual details behind all this who was doing the navigation hmm. my understanding of the way at least history is portrayed in school is the scientists were at odds with the church right hmm. galileo famously was uh, something uh, uh, but uh, utkarsh utkarsh a lot of that stuff has also been made up uh, hmm. by later people you know so as to show the period of the renaissance and the period of the uh, rising up against the church in a very good light this is post renaissance post industrial revolution this we are talking about things as they were seen in the 19th century 18th century when people mm-hmm. were looking back to the 15th century mm-hmm. if you look at galileo's life it's not the kind of portrayal that you will see has come down to us from the 19th and 20th century he had quite a you know uh, he had a lot of connections and uh, discussion and engagement with the church of course he okay. was put in that enemy of the church category and they removed him only in 1992 i believe but the real truth is also that post enlightenment there was a certain way in which western historians wanted to look at the history of the medieval period and that was the okay. way they looked at it but that is a topic for another day actually because it's a, a, a well it's a story in its own right and right now we are in the story of you know we're following the story of the falsification of okay the roots of a lot of math and science now this falsification i've told you how it was done through various through translations then through appropriation through attribution to somebody else and uh, examples of this are legion which examples will we do today you know what i want to do is uh, i just wanted to again you know mention something before i go to say euclid he is one of our big stories today but have you heard of the antikythera mechanism it no. was discovered in greece in 1901 and oh, wait, this uh, is that was, uh, this is that piece of machinery discovered under water yes yes something yes. like that yes so it is uh, supposed to be the first analog computer in the world it was made by the greeks in the 2nd century before the common era and it was found in the 2nd century bc in the 2nd century bc the greeks did not know fractions they were struggling with the m c x i i i hmm. they knew nothing but hmm. this has been happily attributed to the man utkarsh i had occasion to go and see it in a museum you know it's just a broken down piece of stone the number of learned treatises written on it the number of evidentiary and conclusion uh, conclusion jumps made on it it just boggles the mind so on zero or no evidence whole mansions of stories are built and thus is also the story of euclid which is why i mentioned this antikythera and this antikythera is kind of you know it's it's a it's a thorn in my side because i've seen it i know about greek mathematics and i've read the articles and papers that people have written on it the kind of lies and you know they are all stated in very profound and uh, you know with a lot of jargon and with a lot of peer review so that i say that you are right you say that x is right x says that i am right and it's a very nice little circle the point i am making here again is that evidence is very thin on the ground when we discuss indian history a lot of times we are asked for really solid evidence if the same standards of solid evidence more than solid evidence are applied to so many of these things they will just you know disappear so i am going to talk to you about uh, euclid now why have i chosen euclid i could give you a long story about anyone so why have i chosen mm-hmm. euclid mm-hmm. see because the today there is an idea a vague kind of idea that this whole western orientation of the origins of mathematics is not correct 
So uh, some of the uh, bastions of maths are also being forced to consider non-Western origins of math. So this has become a question. Is multicultural math a thing? Is multicultural math, is it mathematically correct? So mm. does it handicap students if you start teaching non-Western math? This is a question which has become important. The Western assumptions which this multicultural math challenges, there are two or three main assumptions. The first is that it is universal and secular math. Second is that math originated with the Greeks. The third is the maths of theorem proving is valuable and therefore should be taught today. That math of theorem proving is Greek math. So therefore, Greek math should be taught today and math is where uh, Greece is where math originated. It is Euclid and his book called Elements, which is central to all these three things. So what is this uh, elements? These are the elements of geometry because the Greeks were supposed to be brilliant at geometry. So these are certain axioms on the basis of the axioms you work out a lot of geometrical problems. I'm sure you remember from school like I also remember from school. So this is Euclidean geometry and you know I used to love Euclidean geometry. I used to absolutely love it when I was in school. But what is the truth of Euclid? So he is supposed to be from Alexandria. And uh, he was born in around uh, 300 BCE. His race is assumed to be white Caucasian. Did you, you just tell me, oh no, no, you were thinking of Pythagoras. Although, you know, CK Raju makes a very interesting point about the pictures of Pythagoras or uh, um, Euclid or anybody that we have. Because of course, there are no portraits, portraits extant of them. From where do we get these pictures? They're just made up. They are made up using white Caucasian principles. So, in fact, all of them look very similar. Hmm, if you go to that true. very famous site, uh, <laughs> MacTutor Maths, it's a, a very famous site for mathematics. You check out their pictures, just look at them all. They look very similar because they are generic. They are generic white men. Some with beards, some without beards, whatever. But they are generic white men. Hmm. Now, it uh, one would assume that if he was born in 300 BC, there is a copy of the elements of Euclid, which has been written down once, recopied, 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 and so it down it has come down to us. That would make sense. However, there is no such copy. There is no such mention. Till somebody called Proclus <coughs> mentions him. Proclus is said to have lived in the 5th century in Constantinople. And also in Athens. So he is the one who in one of his books and you know it is grandiosely called a commentary. It's not really a commentary. He, it's just a kind of one line that yes uh, Euclid is supposed to have written elements. So the, when is this? this? is 700 years after Euclid's life. 700 years that you find the first mention. There are many commentaries on elements. These commentaries have been written by somebody called Theon and his daughter Hypatia. Have you heard of this uh, Neoplatonic school, uh, Utkarsh? They are very famous for being the last Neoplatonic school. The Christians murdered and lynched Hypatia in her own salon because she was an intellectual woman who they couldn't handle. She was the daughter of Theon. So it is this Neoplatonic school of Theon and Hypatia which has written a lot of commentaries on elements. Nowhere hmm. does it say that Euclid is the author. Whoever writes it just mentions the author of elements. Does not say it is Euclid. And you know uh, what is very funny and interesting. Most all almost all copies except one will say that this is the commentary of Theon on elements and uh, either commentary of Hypatia or commentary of Plo Proclus and all of them mention Theon or Hypatia. There is just one copy which does not mention Theon or Hypatia and guess what? 
the church decided that this is the primary source remember this primary source is till 7 800 years later and they have it preserved in the vatican and no doubt if you go there'll be it will be there in a museum first copy of elements of euclid or some such stuff <laughs> but you see all other 99.9% of those commentaries which mention the new platonic school of theon hypatia ignored the one which does not say anything just says writer of elements euclid's name is not there that is kept in the uh, vatican so this manuscript is derived in some way from that neo platonic school of theon and hypatia which was about say uh, you know again in the 5th century now even uh, historians today historians of math admit that uh, historians of geometry before proclus have never ever mentioned euclid so the first mention of euclid is in proclus now when do we first hear of proclus by the way so we should have heard of proclus in the 4th century hmm. no we hear of proclus in the 13th century it is a 13th century document which says that proclus lived in the 4th century and proclus mentioned euclid who lived in the in 300 bce do you get the slate of hand now it is a 13th century document it's called the mona census 427 document a manuscript and the remarks in it are totally vague and hearsay so if we go to the 13th century and 300 bce that is 1600 years after he is supposed to have lived that is the first mention so europe learnt of it only from the trans uh, you know elements was adopted by, uh, by the arabs after proclus the christian world had forgotten about him elements was then picked up and translated by the arabs so uh, this was done in toledo i was telling you about toledo and cordoba so mm-hmm. toledo was very small compared to cordoba but it was there so what do we have over here we just have a 13th century document which they found in arabic which talks about proclus which talks about euclid in just kind of you know one line kind of off hand remarks which could also be ignored but we have to have the fiction that all of knowledge came from ancient greece therefore they had to go back to ancient greece so this person called euclid was invented and elements was attributed to him direct primary source evidence of euclid does not exist it is only this 1600 years later an off hand remark of somebody who made another off hand remark that is the only thing that we have about euclid so in case you were very attached to euclid we can have a 2 minute silence for his death or non existence <laughs> wow okay so and i'll give you you know uh, another yeah. way, uh, thing that is what can be the source of this word euclid so euclides is a word euclides ukli means key and this means space or direction so euclides probably meant key to geometry which was mistranslated as a name euclides this is a very plausible explanation for the word euclides so translation errors happened a lot in uh, uh, toledo and also in uh, cordoba because they you know people over there did not know uh, arabic very well they used people to translate they used uh, muzarrab or jewish intermediaries so from arabic it was translated into romance language and then from that into latin so let's look at where we got sign from sign comes from sinus which means fold which means in arabic jeb jeb you know means a pocket now where did this jeb come from it was written as j and b you know that in the aramaic script vowels are not uh, often not used and you are supposed to provide the vowels yourself so this it was written as j and b it was to be read as jeev or j this is the sanskrit for cord that is where it came from so j 
was supposed to be jeev and it was written as j and b it was instead of jeev it was translated as jeb jeb became pocket which became sinus this is how you come to the word sign so these are the kinds of you know mind boggling stuff that happens so 9 centuries after toledo what evidence do we have for euclid this which is the contribution of india to the world zero <laughs> <laughs> so you there's know a, there's a pun uh, in there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yes yes indeed so you know uh, on the basis of throw away one liners a whole edifice has been built and utkarsh when i was small uh, i was about whatever 10 11 years old and i was living in ranchi there was a book which was um, issued by the readers digest company have you ever heard of readers digest of course of it's course it's a very yeah so it, yeah a very uh, you know conservative uh, magazine and uh, in my house it was like the reading material because my father was very fond of readers digest so we had copies going back to 1960 so i often discovered the world through readers digest so there was this book about early um, scientists and mathematicians and role models so i was in love with those people euclid was there edison was there newton was there mary curie was there copernicus was there i w- and their lives the stories of their lives were narrated with such beauty and such wonder you know pythagoras was that young shepherd's son who was looking down at the ground and making things with a stick on the ground and then he uh, you know came to certain realizations <laughs> so these were stories but you know you are laughing and i am laughing today utkarsh but these are the stories that catch you when you are in your formative years hmm. and these are the stories which take root these stories have been built on nothing it is just the credit and credibility of the white man that all of us accepted as colonized people that if they say it it must be correct did you ever think of questioning euclid i didn't when i was in school this was the last thing on my mind does more about concern whether about euclid what i had to remember yeah <laughs> yeah and so you know it just below the radar it kind of slipped in that euclid was this greek man he wrote the elements so obviously he you know discovered geometry although uh, geometry of the sulba sutras which was used for you know in india uh, maths has uh, ganit has had a very very kind of practical approach which is very different from the western philosophical approach i don't know i wish we have time to discuss that too i do want to discuss it you know the differences in approach as mm, far mm. as uh, ganit and as far as math is concerned it's a very interesting topic but i don't know i think uh, maybe we should move on now to what to zero numerals or what would you like talking the so so i'm guessing in this story is why because the uh, the caliphate was the one that was doing all the translation and the compilation yes they had yes. the information about the numerals that came from india and hence they were attributed to arabia is that is that the reason yes is it absolutely okay. absolutely there's uh, no doubt about that but uh, you know perhaps what i should tell you is uh, well how do we know this hmm. what are the books through which we know this what are the translations through which we know this hmm. so okay now uh, the word or algorithm itself comes from algorithm and what was algorithm it was a reference to indian calculations based on the decimal place value system and mm-hmm. the numerals from 1 to 9 and 0 and 1 to 9 this was the uh, this was algorithm so this mm-hmm. where did it come from it came from the arab mathematician whose name was al khwarizmi who lived around 825 of the common era mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now uh, what did he do he wrote uh, two books which were very important now he didn't read uh, write it exactly let me tell you how it happened so this was in the caliphate centered around baghdad 
these were very learned persian scholars this is called the islamic golden age so the this islamic golden age however was mostly in persia so most of the people we will be talking about especially al khwarizmi and you know uh, even ibn sina and so many others they were all persians who had a long history of uh, knowledge and long history of uh, intellectual endeavor so what did they do they did not believe in naql they believed in aql so they read all the translations and then they wrote their books based on those translations and they told you right in the beginning that we have read the works of a b c d from here 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 and we are writing this book so if you look at the exact book from which al khwarizmi based his books it will not be one but many because they did not believe in naql that is copying which they thought was below their dignity they believed in using this aql mm. so it was al khwarizmi who wrote two books one was called kitab al jamwal tafriq bi hisab al hind this hisab al hind was the first one which introduced numerals from 0 to 9 to the europeans remember from baghdad it went to toledo cordoba and then to the rest of europe this was how it introduced uh, these numerals mm. now uh, have you heard about fibonacci so fibonacci yes. fibonacci so sequence so he yes the same fibonacci he wrote about hindu numbers in his book called liber abaci this was a very very influential book hmm. so uh, he uh, wrote this book and it was this one which because it was you know in latin so then it was completely in the mainstream of european intellectual life but it wasn't all that easy it took a good 4 500 years remember this is the 8th 9th century hmm. it took a good 4 500 years for europeans to accept it because they did not they did not like zero they did not like this 1 2 3 4 <laughs> and these uh, uh, algorithms uh, they were not liked by people when uh, fibonacci had written about these numbers he translated into it as liber algorithmi the numero indorum what does it tell you that he gave due credit that these are indian numerals so it's not mm. as if the europeans did not know mm. al khwarizmi gave due credit al hind uh, hisab al hind and this person fibonacci also gave due credit so you can't fault them who you can fault is the later european intellectual class and for that I, after many many hundreds of years of confusion distrust they finally realized that all those m c's x s i i i's are not going to work and the apecas is a hopelessly useless thing in front of these numerals so they had to accept it so what did they do in the 16th century in 1502 there was a very book big, big book written on Uh, mathematics philosophy etc which is called margarita philosophica in that there is a very interesting picture we'll put it on the screen if we can where there are two men competing with each other in a mathematical competition so one of them has these hindu numbers the other has the abacus the poor man with the abacus is losing and looking very sad and there is a lady of arithmetic who's looking very happily at the winning man who's using hindu numerals but guess what the name of the person using hindu numerals is his name is bithias any reference to hindu origins arabic intermediaries finished not there at all so bithias is arguing or competing with pythagoras the losing mm. man with the abacus and bithias once wins so but bithias is he uh, anything to do with hindu numerals anything to do with the arabic intermediary nada so this christian falsification has not happened in a day it has been a thought out process for centuries so it's not going to be easy to really you know dig out everything <laughs> the problem was that these numbers negative numbers these were not really very well understood even by uh, arabs or by europeans mm. so mm. fibonacci also just spoke of 1 to 9 he didn't speak of 0 he couldn't understand it 
this what is this how how can it exist what is this being as well as not being it is in hindu thought that there is the process of being as well as non being parmatma or the uh, well the force behind the world brahman is both is and both is not you will find this in the bhagavad gita so you have to accept this contradictory state of things look at the nastiya sukta in the rigved the first thing it says when there was nothing what was there this kind of philosophical thinking was not there in christian theology so they are just not able to understand how to put a name to nothing we put a name to nothing because we know that parmatma is both something as well as nothing but for them for whom this shunyavad shunyavad is a very important uh, philosophical stream in indian mm. indic philosophical thought where zero has the potential to become anything shunya which means zero which means nothing can become everything so this shunyavad is from where this shunya came it is difficult to understand for europeans and arabs who had no such theology or philosophy so zero took a very 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 long time to take root and like i was mentioning to you even today when they want to go back and understand zero even for popular culture they can't so this is how hindu numerals came to be used in europe now i want to show you what they look like because after all if we don't see what they look like then there's no fun <laughs> Yeah. So uh the first time we see these is in the Mauryan period you know my favorite Mauryans so the first time we see this is in Ashokan Brahmi then from there from Ashokan Brahmi then you uh see this in a temple in Gwalior so you see it in around 500 CE then again you see it in the 9th century and i'm going to talk to you about the Bakshali manuscript in a minute but i'll just i want to show you this picture the gwalior numerals went to the uh, western arabic or they became the gobar numerals they went to they became the eastern arabic numerals then they went to europe the western arabic or gobar numerals went to europe you know why were they called gobar what is gobar gobar is dust and in india the system was to have a kind of uh, you know slate with dust and sand on it and trace numbers on it that's why they were called gobar numerals because they were traced on dust or sand so from there they went to europe then from europe to the europeans and then you know the numerals we see today i don't know if this is visible is it visible i hope it otherwise is otherwise we'll put a screenshot yeah 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 so we'll uh, put this on screen so you can see that there is a kind of direct line which can be drawn and calling it hindu arabic numerals is not exactly correct because the arabs did not contribute anything they just copied it but then for many people including my son he told me that numerals are arabic so which was something uh, which really you know uh, it gave me a stimulus to uh, do this uh, episode of the podcast so this is how uh, indian numerals reached the you know all the different parts of the world not just arab arabs and then baghdad and europe but then they spread to all parts of the world this is one story of the way in which mathematical concepts have gone via the arabs to europe but there is yet another story and that story is the story of calculus but uh, before that i just want to mention that uh, the other book that uh, al khwarizmi wrote was the book on which algebra is based so you know he uh, kind of called it al jabar because there was according to him uh, a kind of forcing numbers to do things that they would not ordinarily do so that's why he, uh, the name of that book was uh, al jabar and from there is where we get algebra what does algebra mean jabar means zabardasti zabar you force numbers to do yes you force numbers to do things because you know there are unknown numbers there there is x there is y there is uh, the avyakt that is in sanskrit so all those numbers are forced to do things so i found it very very amusing that he called mm. it algebra and it is from this jabar that algebra comes so al khwarizmi is a 
very uh, important figure in this whole thing of uh, sending all kinds of mathematical concepts to Europe. I am just looking for whether I have noted down the name of that Al Jabbar book. It's a very long name, so I don't know where I had noted it. Let's see. <laughs> I want to tell you that name because it's funny. And it's funny uh, because Al Jabra comes from it. Ah, uh, yeah, here it is. So, the one on which uh, the numerals are based that was Kitab Al Jambal Tafriq Bi Hisab Al Hind. The one on which Al Jabra is based is Hisab Al Jabra Wal Mukabla. And what is Mukabla? Mukabla is fight. Why does he mm. put all these fighting things in it? Because there are two sides. Dash is equal to dash in any equation. Mm. That is yeah. the Mukabla. And the Jabbar is the Jabardasti. So mm. that's a funny name. I found it <laughs> I found it quite amusing. And it's a long name. But these two books are seminal in this whole going mm. via Baghdad, Toledo, Cordoba mm. and then to the rest of Europe. These, these, these two books are absolutely significant. There's so much is in that, there. I mean, this is the yeah, fundamental is that, basis. Is, is this too much information? No, I think this is the perfect amount of information. I think if I think about what we've covered today, we've basically given the sequence of events that led to knowledge from not necess knowledge that was not Western origin or not European in origin being attributed and taken in uh, by the Europeans and, you know, Assumptions based on assumptions, based on convenient, as uh, whatever was convenient, whatever made sense per the narrative, whatever was required, and that is the basis of the understanding of the history of science today. So it's, yes. I mean, this by itself is. I don't think we can even get into calculus because I'm sure that's going to be a lot more. This itself is like significant. You know, uh, in this talk. one, it is. Uh, in a way, I feel it was a normal process of dissemination. The Greeks mm. and the Europeans had this very clunky system of understanding. Their understanding was mm. poor. The Arabs mm. were smart enough to know that we, if we take this, mm. then it's going to be very useful. So you remember there was that uh, uh, whole merchant class of Florence and merchant class of Venice. They played a very mm. big role in it because it was mm. very easy for them to do business using mm. these numerals. Mm. But you know, they were very, very wary of zero and scared of it because what happened is suppose you entered into a contract of a certain amount and later somebody added three, four zeros. Then the contract <laughs> became so much more valuable. So after yes, suffering from this, the Florentine uh, merchants passed a law that you don't have to write it only in numbers, you will also write it in words. And you know, we still Which is do why it. we write it in the check today. That's why we Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And it makes sense. So, you know, zero is like magic. If Sheldon was praying to zero like a god, I'm not surprised. Because in itself, it is nothing and yet it can change mm. the value of any number by, yeah. by huge amounts. Huge, huge amounts. So, I have two more things that I want to talk to you about, uh, Utkarsh. Mm. One is, of course, the story of the stealing of calculus. And the other is uh, about uh, big numbers, really big numbers. Okay. I want to talk about those yeah. also. So, uh, do you think we have time? How much time do we have? I think we are at about the one or ten minute mark. So. Oh, then maybe not, because exactly. this is going That's to take was... at least uh, yeah. This is going to take at least fifteen twenty minutes. I think it will be an episode minutes. by itself. Yeah. I think so I think yeah. I think Utkash next time I want to talk about calculus. I want to yes. talk about uh, big numbers. I also want to talk in a general way about the differences between Ganit and uh, math. And mm. those are very important. So shall we do it next time? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is enough in this uh, in this conversation already for it's again foundational, right? It is literally foundational. Yes. Like, I mean, I don't care too much about Euclid and uh, Pythagoras, but <laughs> It is just that entire process of attribution, of creation, of yes. cr literally creating a myth, creating yes. a story, which is exactly. just... Exactly, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. our history is turned into myth and their myths are turned into history. 
<laughs> that's how it happens and yeah. uh, we just sit there and do nothing about it yeah well i guess it again like we keep saying it is changing it is just a matter of time but it can't happen soon enough yeah and you know i have mentioned a few people in this uh, episode again uh, in the description i will put down the links to their blog spots or the names of their books etc because uh, for those who are seriously interested of course there is a lot more than what i'm saying i've just you know picked out hmm. a few things hmm. so read hmm. the books and read the blogs read the material and you will your view of mathematics your view of ganit will change so yeah. next time then we'll finish the rest of it i guess yeah we'll do calculus next time I think yes. that's the main one. Yeah. And then we'll move and forward. Big numbers. And big numbers. And big numbers. And big numbers, yeah. And you know, of course, uh, the story of calculus has many villains. Hmm. <laughs> and many I'm false guessing, stories have guess. been made. Yeah. I would, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully you can also <laughs> tell me how I can make calculus interesting for me. Maybe something I should read. <laughs> yes 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 and you know uh, uh, i i will do that actually next time because ck raju is quite a uh, a campaigner for this how to make calculus easier so yeah. i will definitely recommend it next time wonderful okay so we'll end it here again folks thank you for joining um i i, I enjoy the process of getting my mind blown every 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 week so i hope you enjoy it as well and i and hope Utkarsh, you have enough and you know uh, i exa- <laughs> i just can't make out how the time goes you yeah. said it's one hour 10 minutes and uh, i mean it's astonishing uh, because uh, the material is so much and the stories are so many and uh, it's so yeah. important for me to be putting out those stories that i completely lose track of time no it's 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 important because i don't think there was anything extra i think we did need to go into depth with all the things that you were mentioning yes a little depth is necessary because i can't just tell you that this happened without explaining how yeah absolutely mm, that's true okay wonderful we'll see you next time then take care namaste see you next time with the rest of the story that you haven't heard today so tune in again next time namaskar <laughs>